Geeks and geekettes, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Ask Chuck Dixon, where you ask me questions about what I do for a living, and what I do for a living is I write comic books. Um, little change in format. Uh, a lot of you who are watching now may have noticed that uh, there was no show last week. It's because I've been having problems with my video program that I've yet to solve. So I'm um, using a different format here, and uh, maybe this is a good format change because people that know a lot more about this stuff than I do insist that 75% or more of you only listen to the show. You don't watch it. So you're not really seeing the slideshow that I put together uh, as I talk uh, or, or to prompt me as I talk. And um, so, you know, maybe this is the way to go. We'll see. We'll see how this works out. See how you like it. Let me know if you, uh, in the comments, uh, do you listen or watch? And it doesn't matter. Do you care? Uh, and but, but I didn't want to delay doing another episode until I get these other problems fixed because you've got so many questions. You need answers. i got to give you answers. So let's start with uh, Ivam Aguila. Uh, which one you had more fun and which one would you do if you had one more single shot Western Punisher or Bat Pirate. Um, as much as I love Westerns, as much as I love the Punisher, Bat Pirate would be the one because uh, I had a, a couple more stories I wanted to tell of Captain Leatherwing, uh, the uh, pirate version of Batman that first appeared in Detective Comics Annual Number no. 7. Uh, I had a story where uh, he and um, Catwoman, the pirate Catwoman, uh, return to England, and we find out that Captain Leatherwing is actually a, a titled nobleman, uh, and uh, he's returning to his manor. And uh, it's kind of a Henry Fielding kind of adventure story uh, where he runs into Lord Conundrum, which is the Riddler. Uh, Riddler is an Irishman uh, who plagues Captain Leatherwing with riddles. There's also a, an insane uh, noblewoman on the next manor over, uh, largely based on Poison Ivy, who who's, uh, creates uh, toxins and noxious plants in her enormous greenhouse, you know, like her like five acre greenhouse. And I was gonna have a lot of fun with that, with um, uh, Captain Leatherwing and Catwoman turning highwaymen uh, rather than pirates. And, uh, and there was a third one I wanted to do, a kind of man in the iron mask story with Captain Leatherwing. And it would be the origin of, um, pirate version of Bane. Uh, but um, I sadly never got around to these. I've talked to DC a couple of times. You know, if we were to do just one more of these, there would be enough for a trade paperback of um, Captain Leatherwing and the 10-page Penguin story I did. Uh, collected together, we, we could get up to 100 pages pretty soon and have a decent pirate trade paperback because uh, Pirate Batman was really popular. Uh, really, um, a lot of people responded to it. It launched a you know, uh, a, a line of toys, at Kenner. I mean, it was a big deal when it came out. And I still get a lot, obviously, a lot of questions about it. And uh, I'd, I'd like to see more. I'm, I'm sure you would too. <laughs> uh, Kia and Kurji, what exactly, do, why exactly do you think The Departed is such a bad film? I personally was engrossed throughout. Uh, the Departed, a Martin Scorsese movie, uh, it's based on a Hong Kong, uh, actually a series of Hong Kong uh, police thrillers uh, called Infernal Affairs. And they kind of recast the Infernal Affairs plotline where uh, one brother is a crook and the other one is a cop. Um, they transferred it to uh, the real life criminal activities of Whitey Bulger in Boston. And I thought it was a poor fit for a story a true crime story that could have been told better without the gimmick of the, you know, two brothers. Um, I, I thought a better approach, was, you know, Scorsese could have made two films. He could have made a film about Whitey Bulger. which probably would have been better than the end result. Um, and he could have made another film, you know, a, a, a pure remake of Infernal Affairs without the true crime connections. Uh, and be kind of a, Jimmy Cagney, Humphrey Bogart, throwback kind of movie, which I know Scorsese would have dug that idea. And uh, my other problem was is that 
you know, Matt Damon and Leonardo DiCaprio, they, they, they look too much alike. <laughs> I got confused over which one was the crook and which one was the, was the cop. Uh, and then I generally don't like Matt Damon in anything anyway. I don't find him terribly convincing. And I thought Jack Nicholson was wildly miscast as Whitey Bulger. And, um, you know, Nicholson is a real character actor, a real personality actor, but I think he, he leaned too much on that, uh, chewing the scenery, um, rather than giving a good performance. And it was just, it was, it was just an awful sort of Scorsese phoning it in, you know, and the final insult was that at the end of the movie, that symbolism with the rat, <laughs> it's like, okay, we get it. The guy's a rat. Uh, <laughs> I just just didn't enjoy it. It just was really, it's, it's probably the worst Scorsese movie I've ever seen. And I really like Scorsese's movies, but this was by far the worst thing he had ever done, in my opinion. Um, I think it would have been better as to either emphasize on the true story or emphasize on the um, the high concept of the original, the Hong Kong action original. So there's where I fall on that subject. Um, Creeper Weirdo asks, what was the name of the 2000 AD story about hunting dinosaurs for meat? It was called Flesh, and it ran in several, I mean, the first installments um, were in 2000 AD. Uh, they were hunting land animals, uh, and that story kind of ended after a few months. And then they brought it back a little later and, and, and an even better uh, gimmick where they're hunting dinosaurs at sea you know they're they're bringing in mosasaurs and megalodons and the thing about flesh that was just wonderful <laughs> was how incredibly gory it was i mean it was every 11 year old dinosaur fans fantasy of an action story this was jurassic park meets slasher movies i mean the the, the stories are incredibly violent uh, human life, like it is in so many 2000 AD stories, human life is meaningless. <laughs> no. And so you had, you know, uh, hunters and, and um, the uh, sailors on the ship and everything else just, just getting gobbled up by the bushel load, just horrible things happening. Uh, all the plot lines were deconstructed plot lines where everything that could go wrong did go wrong. It was the dinosaur movie combined with the disaster movie. And this is all well ahead of Jurassic Park. And uh, it's just good stuff. Uh, I wish they would do, you know, full-size collections. Uh, I'd buy an omnibus of flesh in a heartbeat. Just, uh, you know, the marvelously drawn detail. I wish I could tell you the name of the artist, but I don't remember. Marvelously drawn detail of, um, of uh, hapless victims falling into the jaws <laughs> of T-Rexes and Megalodons and things like that. Just amazing, amazing stuff. Creeper Weirdo again. Someone told you they thought the Nazis were overplayed in war fiction. You said they're a great villain because the Nazis are evil. Agree? Controversial, I know. <laughs> I think Nazis are bad. Oh, you're so brave. Uh, I, I think this is a generational difference. See, when you were told that a guy was a Nazi in 70, 80, 90, your reaction was either, no, he's not, or is he? I had no idea. To the guy that told you they're overplayed, it's a childish insult that he's called constantly, probably, or, or he's called someone else. Uh, you see them as a historical evil. He sees them as a cartoon. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. I mean, my... Um, my dad and a lot of the dads in my neighborhood actually uh, had close contact with real Nazis. Uh, and you know, my father-in-law in particular, uh, he fought uh, up the spine of Italy uh, following the SS uh, back up into Central Europe. So uh, he came face to face, literally face to face with uh, hardcore Nazis. So yeah, to me, Nazi means only one thing. Uh, it means, you know, a bad guy. <laughs> with a skull on his helmet and, uh, you know, he has no redeeming features, you know, uh, other than he dresses very stylishly. <laughs> so, and to me, the Nazis, is just, this is the history's ultimate bad guys. I mean, unless you go back to like the Mongols or the Aztecs, uh, you know, these are all great villains because they're, they were, um, 
They were the product of societies in decline. And the Nazis are very much a product of a society in decline. I mean, no, no country in the 20th century was more on its knees, either you know, morale-wise or financially, than the Germans. And uh, when you push people into a corner like that, when you degrade their society the way that the uh, allies of World War I did to Germany, um, you're going to get something real bad as a result. Uh, and this is, this is what happens when you push people around. This is what happened. The, the Mongols were a put upon people uh, who, you know, wanted revenge on the whole world. Uh, the Aztecs, the same thing. They were put upon by the tribes around them. And when they got on top, finally, when they got the power, uh, trouble, trouble brews. So, yeah, they're perfect villains. Today, everybody's a Nazi. Everybody's a racist. Everybody's a homophobe. Uh, it's just thrown around. I, I think it's thrown around way too lightly for a, uh, a crowd of people responsible for the deaths of tens of millions. Uh, so yeah, I, I, can, I see the difference, but uh, we should all understand the historical evil of both uh, Nazism and uh, uh, you know, world communism. You know, because world communism is, you know, they're the A-team. The Nazis were the farm team at massacre and people. Uh, the communists in the 20th century, they hold the record. You know, 200 million dead, maybe, between the uh, Russian Revolution up to up to Mao Zedong, the Vietnam War, Pol Pot. Yeah, they 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 put some numbers on the board, my friend. So let's go to the next question. Joshua Ignatowski, you have some inside baseball stories from the comics biz that illustrate why a letterer's job is so important. Well, I mean, it's it's quite simple. If you've ever seen a poorly lettered comic book, you know it. It's just it can have absolutely gorgeous art. And if the lettering is bad, you know, poorly spaced, the balloons aren't in the right place, um, and placement is everything, uh, you know, it just, it brings the whole thing down. Brings, the letterer's job is very, very important. And, and the problem is that letterer's job, it's an invisible job because uh, if he's doing his job properly, you, you should never notice the letter. Uh, I say the same thing for writing and coloring as well. You shouldn't notice those things. Art, you have to notice it's a visual medium, but the lettering is something that should be invisible. And the best letterers, you know, uh, their work goes unnoticed, except by people within the industry. Um, I was shown uh, when I was at DC one time, it was uh, a lettering job uh, marked up. Now, this is back when they would send you the Xeroxes and the lettering, you know, the, the balloons would be placed by the writer. This is when they worked Marvel style. And um, Mike Carlin marked this thing up. Uh, he marked up this writer's balloon placement. And, 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 and he even wrote on it because he wrote it for the writer to be sent to the writer. You know, why this balloon's in the wrong place and this balloon's in the right place. And you need to move this sound effect over here and you need to do this and you need to do that. Boy, I wish I kept a copy of that. Because it was really instructional. Carlin was a, you know, he was an editor, but he understood everything about well, he understands everything about comics. So, so he knew how to place balloons as well as an expert letterer. The writer did not. And, and so it was sort of a tutorial on balloon placement, which is very, very important because it's, that is the reading experience. You're reading the balloons. You want them placed so that they don't get in the way of the art, and they also lead you to the next panel. There's a million, million things to think about when you're a letterer. And uh, it's, it's not an easy job. It's not just sticking the balloon down, putting the words in there. It's, uh, and, and if you ever hear letterers talk to each other about their different theories, because they all have different styles, different fonts. You know, uh, I remember two letterers I knew personally going at it about whether you, if you had a caption, narration caption, did you have it, you know, up against the border or did you step it off the border in a panel a little bit? And both of them were on opposite sides of that equation. <laughs> and uh, they, they really had a heated argument about which was best. To me, I like to see the caption stepped off a little bit. Uh, but my letterer didn't believe that. And I wasn't going to argue with him. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a very, very important job. Um, do I have a favorite Muppet, Joshua asks. Uh, yeah, it would be um, Ralph the Dog. Uh, largely because he's the first Muppet I was really exposed to 
as a kid, uh, Ralph was the uh, Jimmy Dean of Jimmy Dean Sausages, uh, was <laughs> was a singer, I guess songwriter in the in the 60s. He had a big hit, you know, with something. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, big John. He had a big, big hit, Big John. And uh, he had a weekly TV show. And he was like the only country Western performer on television at the time. And every week he would have a segment with Ralph the dog. It was a Muppet. Ralph would play the piano, much as you've seen him do on the Muppet show. And uh, him and uh, Jimmy Dean would exchange, uh, you know, witty remarks. And and Ralph would play one of his funny little songs. And uh, I just fell in love with it. I just thought, this is awesome. And I didn't know who the Muppets were. No one knew who the Muppets were. The Muppets didn't have a name. Well, I mean, they had a name for their business, but we didn't. Publicly, we didn't know who the Muppets were. It was a meaningless word. Um, but I began to look out for them and recognize that style. You know, Muppet, it's a guy working the mouth and another guy working the arms with, you know, wires. Uh, pretty easy to spot. And you would see it, uh, the Muppets show up in television commercials and things like that. And it really wasn't until they started appearing on shows like The Ed Sullivan Show and things like that that they got a name. But Ralph was my favorite. Uh, even to this day, uh, j- just a, a fun character. And I love those those screwy songs he would sing. Joshua, again, you've mentioned the way that Eric July has run Ripperverse comics and has caused the company to avoid pitfalls that have been the bane of other comic companies in the past. And I ask what the most major of these pitfalls are so that any aspiring comics entrepreneurs listening will be able to avoid these pitfalls like Eric has. Well, the number one thing Eric didn't do, he didn't go from his initial success and say, wow, this sold well. Let's just start crapping stuff out. <laughs> he didn't say that. He didn't do that. If you notice, I mean, now now the schedule for Ripperverse will pick up. There will be more releases released more frequently because he's brought in more creators. He's brought in the Saska sisters. He's brought in Mike Barron. He's brought in myself. So we're all busy writing stuff. I'm on my I'm in the middle of like my fourth thing I've done for him or I am doing for him. And uh, so the, it will step up. But but at first it was just Isom and Isom 2. And they were you know, followed by you know, quite a bit of time in between. And uh, so he, he didn't just immediately say, I just got to crap, crap stuff out. If, I'm, if, it, if this is going to be a money machine for me, I got to get more stuff out there. No. No, he said, I want to bring out, Eric is dedicated to quality comics work, which is what attracts me to the company and to Eric and to the Ripperverse because they want to, he wants to produce, he, he and all his people are 150% behind producing quality comics, comics that are enduring, comics you'll want to read and reread, uh, building a world you'll want to revisit again and again. And um, and everybody he's brought on board, me, the Saskas, uh, Mike, you know, we're all of the same mindset that we, we just want to do really good work. And we want to work with top artists, which Eric is bringing to us. Um, and we want we just want to do good comics. Um, it's never been about the money to me. It's never been. I mean, yeah, I want to reach readers and I want to make a living wage so I can look across the dinner table at my family without being ashamed. Um, but it's never been about, it's, it's, it's always been about doing good work. Um, and, and the money will follow. Uh, I've always found that, you know, the higher quality you work, the more enduring it is. Uh, you know, which is why I have IPs and stories and things like that that have been in, you know, near constant publication for 30 or more years. Because, you know, I and my, and the artists I work with and all the collaborators, you know, we worked hard to create something that you folks would really enjoy and continue to enjoy, not just throw away entertainment. And that's where, you know, that Eric shares that mindset. The other thing is he didn't spend money on crazy stuff like, you know, spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on convention appearances and things like that, because that's all just a pissing contest. Um, it really doesn't bring in new readers. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a big reason why cross gen went uh, belly up so quickly. They're spending $1 million per convention appearance with, with flying talent to places, 
setting up that enormous booth, uh, just you know, leasing that enormous booth space. It was a million bucks. It cost 20 grand just to ship that booth around. Uh, you know, and, and Eric's not, you know, he know, he understands, he's a businessman. He understands, you know, this is good money after bad. Um, we're gonna we're gonna put our money in the books. We're gonna put our money in what the public sees. And we're gonna, you know, bring you the best books and and everything else. The tchotchkes are, you know, you know, the clothing, sweatshirts, t-shirts, caps, things like that. It's, it's all it's all the highest quality stuff. And and uh, it's it's kind of a Disney mentality. The, the better quality we present, the more successful we'll be because the public appreciates quality. Uh, we're not pandering or anything else. And and you know that's what I really like about it. Now there's probably a million other things because I'm not I'm no businessman. Probably a million other things Eric did behind the scenes that I'm not aware of that were all smart moves. Uh, but you know he's he's got a he's got a pretty huge facility. He employs a bunch of people who are some of the happiest people on earth. <laughs> it was just a, it was the great vibe when I visited there. Um, so I mean, obviously everyone's taken care of and everything else, and and he's looking at longevity. He's looking at the long game. So it's not just about um, you know cranking out quantity of content. It's quality of content. Like I said, the, the schedule is step on, going to step up. You're going to see more things more frequently from the company, uh, but it's all going to be, you know, solid stuff. Okay, JDC, Mr. Coates, uh, regarding the latest kerfuffle, man, this is a tiny letter, uh, regarding who was involved in co-creating the Marvel Comics character Wolverine, in your opinion, what defines contributing to the creation of a character IP. Also, uh, can the editor receive credit, creator credits? Um, yeah, I mean, this latest thing about Roy Thomas claiming uh, that he helped create Wolverine um, is puzzling to me because um, he never made this claim while uh, either Chris Claremont or uh, Herb Trimpey were alive. Uh, I'm sorry, Len Wein. Um, and, and Herb Trimpey is the first person to draw it. And Johnny Ramita Sr., who was the, uh, he, he designed the Wolverine costume. Um, you know, none of them are around to say no. Uh, and I don't really understand why Roy at this late date would do this. Uh, largely because, I mean, bragging rights? Because that's all you're going to get. I mean, Marvel's not going to send you any money. <laughs> You you don't have any paper. You can't really prove your claim. And even if you could, Marvel wouldn't send you any money. Uh, I don't think that, you know, Len Wein or uh, John Romita saw much of anything from their participation in creating Wolverine. Uh, because Marvel is set up differently than, say, DC Comics. Because Marvel, it's, uh, there are not royalties. First of all, there's no participation in character creation. Any money they give you is what they call an incentive. They never call it a royalty because it's not. It's, it's, um, it's arbitrary. It's up to them. It's, um, they, they give you what they feel that they want to give you. It's a gift. Uh, and so they're under no legal obligation to give you anything because you have no paperwork. Uh, in the old Marvel paychecks, you, when, you, when you endorsed the back, there was like all this small print saying that, you know, by, by cashing this check, you've given up all rights to the thing that you've created for us. I mean, it's, it's work for hire at its coolest, at its least participatory for the creator. So I don't understand why Roy is, is claiming at this late date that he helped create Wolverine. Also, you know, naming him and saying that he should come from Canada, is that really creating him? Uh, you know, shouldn't Chris Claremont and John Byrne get some credit if that's the bar? Because, you know, they did so much to develop the character. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 an, it's an argument that it, it, it's puzzling to me. And, you know, I've been involved in a similar situation where a, uh, someone insisted that they were part of creating something that I created 
And the policy at DC Comics at the time was that uh, the editors would not get involved in a fight between freelancers, that they, they would just be Switzerland. And <clears throat> so the, the, the claims of this other creator were honored, uh, even though their contribution was you know, less than Roy's on Wolverine, quite frankly. So yeah, it's a it's a funny, gray, weird area in comics because for the most part, none of this stuff has ever been nailed down. Although, you know, that's that's gonna that's changing with creator owned contracts that are fair. Um, not all creator owned contracts are that fair, but there there are some out there. And uh that's why you have to guard your creator, you know, because when when you sign away rights to something, even if you're a creator and you sign away ancillary rights and things like that. Generally, the person buying them wants everything. Never give anybody everything. Uh, keep something for yourself, uh, be it publication or audio rights or, you know, whatever. Um, but, you know, this is how big companies operate. But again, puzzle. I don't know why Roy did this. Uh, I, I don't, I don't even, I didn't even research this to find out if he's publicly made a statement as to why he's making this claim. Um, Dino, the coach, uh, how many hours does it take you to produce an episode of Ask Chuck Dixon? Well, this one's going to take exactly as long as, um, it takes. <laughs> Producing a weekly podcast certainly does take a good amount of time. Do you do it by yourself or do you enlist your sons to help you? As I do believe one or both are involved in the media field. Uh, no, I do it all by myself. Uh, all the mistakes and sort of uh, low budget, uh, let's put on a show kind of aspect of what I'm doing here. It's all me. I, my sons have nothing to do with it. Trust me, if, if they did have something to do with it, it would look a lot more professional. And I probably wouldn't have had the problems with my video program that I've experienced recently, uh, which is why, you know, you got to be looking at my smiling face this week. Um, on to the next question, Coach, again. It's clear from your many references to Denny O'Neill that you had a great respect and admiration for him. Not a secret that you're a conservative, and as I understand it, Denny was a liberal. Did you ever have any effect? Did that ever have any effect on the two of you collaborating on any storytelling ideas? Did the two of you ever discuss politics? If so, what were those conversations like? Um, yeah, there was, a, you know, I, I remember particularly discussions about the environment. And, uh, you know, I was a global, well, still am, a global warming denier. And, and Denny had never met anybody who didn't buy into the whole Earth Day thing. And I was kind of like a zoo animal, an exotic beast to him. And he would ask a lot of questions about, you know, how I came to these conclusions and things like that. And, you know, I had ready answers and logic and, and things like that. Uh, and, and, you know, so, yeah, we had political discussions. I don't remember they ever got heated. Uh, there were a couple of bat summits where it got heated between Doug Mensch and I, uh, because I think Doug Mensch saw me and, and continues to see me as a, uh, a, a dangerous endangered species. <laughs> oh, um, it, it got a little heated, but, but it, when the, when lunch was over or, or whatever, uh, coffee break time was over. Uh, we went right back to work, and there was no there was no problems. There was no animosity. Nothing held against us. Now, now, as far as politics in the work, um, you know, I presented to Denny that in Robin, in particular, because Robin was a teenage character, he was going to high school with other teenagers, and and teenagers were facing issues that I didn't face when I was a kid. You know, we didn't think about guns in school. We didn't think about drugs. You know, that was kind of like a new thing when I was in school. Um, and, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, teenage pregnancy. You know, uh, things that are really, really common now to adolescent kids uh, were not common when I was a kid. But I realized if we're doing these stories set in that environment, uh, we need to address those issues. They have to, they are possible grist for stories. And then he was all for it as long as they were grist for stories. Denny, who, you know, made a big name for himself in fandom by being, you know, the guy who did relevant comics about relevant political issues, I think he'd learned his lesson and realized you can't just base a story on a New York Times headline. 
Uh, there actually has to be a story. And of course, all I cared about was a story. I didn't want to write about teenage pregnancy because I wanted to raise awareness about teenage pregnancy because that's a lot of BS. Uh, I'm writing a comic book, for God's sake. Uh, I'm not going to change the world. Um, so from we both approached it from that aspect that we were going to deal with an issue and we, as as it related to a story and as it related to our characters. And on that, we were on 100% agreement. And I also said, you know, to Denny, I said, you know, uh, I'm not going to use this to, you know, espouse my political beliefs uh, any more than, than you should espouse yours. I mean, we had many, many discussions about Green Lantern and Green Arrow. I mean, I was very frank with uh, Denny that I, I hated that series. Uh, because it was so political. I didn't want to read about politics with superheroes in it. Uh, but anyway, I mean, but Denny, Denny had evolved, you know, to realize that the only way to deal with issue, relevancy, topical things was to approach them in a way that presented the issue, presented both sides of the controversy, and left it up to the reader to decide where they fell on this issue. I mean, maybe the stories would be a little thought provoking, but they would not be um, indoctrinating. And I was all for that. I was all for that. So we dealt with, you know, I think particularly the issue with teen pregnancy. I think we presented every side of the argument and, uh, and Stephanie made her decision. And of course, it's a, in my mind, Stephanie was never going to abort her child. I mean, I did not want that in that character's continuity. And I was given leeway because I had created the character along with Tom Lyle. And I did not want that in the character's story. Um, I didn't want, you know, and so, you know, there you go. But yeah, I mean, the subject came up, but like I say, it's, it's not like now where there's this, you know, bitter divide between everybody and it gets personal and nasty and name calling. Um, it was just like, I believe this, you believe that. We'll, we'll agree to disagree. Now let's get back to making comedy. Coach again. Uh, I've completed all the Levon Cade books with the exception of the most recent release. I have a question about Levon's daughter, Mary. Uh, just to get it, my timeline correct, how many years from the first book to the most recent release has transpired? I believe she started out about 12 and is now approximately 16. Do I have that correct? I, I thought of her as like around 10 or 11. I didn't really nail it down because you never want to nail these things down. Uh, and I did, I've i never nailed down how much time passes between each book. Uh, because, you know, you want these books to be evergreen. You don't, you don't know what order people are going to read them in. You don't know uh, if they're going to read a few and then maybe six months later come back to the series, you know, whatever. So I never nailed down. Uh, just like I never nailed down exactly where in Alabama a lot of the action takes place. Uh, you know, I made up a county. I made up the local towns. Um, you know, I didn't want to nail down uh, Mary's age. So, uh, you know, there you go. But, yeah, I, I think she's, with the most recent book, she's driving. So she's obviously a little older than 16. Although where they're, where she's driving... Uh, you know, you you can you get a driver's license at 14 uh, if you have a special reason to, like if you have a a, a, a relative who's handicapped or something like that. There, there's a little bit of trivia for you. Uh, in some of these states, like southern states and far west states, uh, you can you can get a driver's license at 14. Of course, you can you know in a lot of these states you can be driving a tractor or a you know half million dollar combine at 12. <laughs> Nobody's looking. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, she, she's about 16 in, in, the, in the most recent book. Garrett Davis. There are days when I have story ideas that become progressively more fleshed out over time and show potential. However, I often get stuck when trying to come up with a name for the story. Does that ever happen to you? What advice would you give regarding coming up with titles for stories? Well, I used to get a lot of crap from the DC guys in the bat office because I would use song titles um, <laughs> or, or lyrics from songs as, as the title. Uh, 
and, and I wasn't trying to get anything past them. I just thought, hey, this I'm listening to music while I'm writing. I'm like, hey, that's a good song title. Just write it down. Uh, I, that'd be a good title for a story. Uh, so, you know, titling stuff is hard. I mean, uh, I, I, I was talking about Levon. I, I want to do a series of books with a possessive in them uh, so that uh, you, you would know from the title it was part of the series. Um, so I came up with the name Levon Cade, and I came up with the idea of Levon's trade, and then I made, immediately made a list to make sure it would work. You know, Levon's Night, Levon's Ride, Levon's War, Levon's Time. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of cool titles here, cool, cool, you know, action-oriented, manly titles I can, you know, words I can add uh, to Levon's Possessive um, to make for a good title. So that saved me all that trouble <laughs> of thinking up titles for those books. Uh, but for the comic stories and stuff, yeah, a lot of a lot of that, uh, you know, uh, I try to avoid Shakespeare quotes. I particularly hate when people use Shakespeare quotes for titles or stories and they, they use it the wrong way. I mean, how many things have been called Sound and the Fury? Um, that was Shakespeare's description of a, a, a tale told by an idiot. Why would you name your stories <laughs> Sound and Fury? Um Maybe I'll write a novel someday called A Tale Told by an Idiot. See, see how much fun I could have with that. But um, I know there's enough novels like that out there. Uh, so, yeah, coming up with the titles is, is, is sometimes tough for me because um, you've got to come up with good ones. Um, like my zombie novel, Gomers, uh, I, I call it Gomers because it's an acronym used by uh, emergency room uh, workers. And it's an acronym that stands for get out of my emergency room. <laughs> and I always wanted to use it as the title for a book. And I thought, well, zombies, gomers, yeah, why not? Uh, but I, I got a couple of, of, of funny uh, title stories. I read recently where when um, Peter Benchley was writing Jaws, he, he had a, a, a title for it. And, and I forget what it was like, Death from Below or death in the deep sea or whatever and the publisher and the movie company because the deal was done simultaneously uh jaws was such a high concept idea that the, the, the publishing company and the movie company became interested in it simultaneously so nobody liked that title and they told benchley to go away and and think of some a new title and he ended up asking his dad and his dad was robert benchley if you're an old movie fan, you'd know Robert Benchley immediately. He's a character actor. He's also a humorist. He wrote for The New Yorker and places like that. He was one of the Algonquin Roundtable, the famous or infamous group of humor writers uh, who hung out in the Algonquin Hotel in New York and an extremely funny guy. And um, so Peter asked his dad, you know, I, I'm having trouble. Can you help me think of some titles? And... Um, Robert Benchley came up with 200 possible titles for his son's shark novel. Uh, my favorite was, what's that gnawing on my leg? <laughs> <laughs> but included in the list was Jaws. And Benchley took this to his publisher and the film company, and they were like, yep, yeah, that's, that's beautiful. That's simplicity itself. So that's how Jaws was named. Uh, another funny title about another funny story about titles is um, Steve Gerber, creator of Man Thing and Howard the Duck. Uh, when he first started regularly working for Marvel, he was given the assignment of writing Marvel Team Up, and uh, they told him he said, "I don't know what to title these stories. How do you title a comic story?" And they said, "Well, readers love it. You know, we sell more issues if the word death is in the title." <laughs> And so for over a year, every issue of Marvel Team Up had death in the title of the story until the editors noticed what he was doing, <laughs> told him to cut it out. <laughs> Another good story about titling something was uh, Doug Mensch did a, uh, a one-shot Batman special set in Blackgate Prison, and he called it Batman colon, Blackgate, colon, Isle of Men. In other words, an island with nothing but men on it. Um, that was all fine, but nobody had ever said it out loud. 
And so the marketing guys at DC told me that, that when they were calling retailers saying, hey, did you order Batman Isle of Men? And the retailers would go, I love men? <laughs> and the marketing guys go, yeah, it's a prison story. So, yeah, if you come up with a title, make sure you say it out loud. <laughs> okay, Nick Lenz. Chuck, do you have any fond memories of Neil Adams? I met him six times in person. A great guy to meet. Um, yeah, you know, Neil was a prickly pear. You never asked Neil his opinion uh, unless you were, like, strapped down and girded and ready for uh, his answer. Because <laughs> he was... Um, Neil was not shy, not a shy man. But uh, yeah, I had some great conversations with him. Uh, one, particularly, I remember uh, Graham and I, uh, Neil was a, a big advocate for creators and freelancers. And um, he'd go to bat. I mean, he'd, he'd, he'd pester the hell out of people if he thought something, someone was being wronged. I mean, he's he's largely the reason that Siegel and Schuster ever got any money out of DC Comics for creating Superman. Because um, he just wouldn't leave it alone. And you didn't want Neil in your face, you know. Um, so when he heard about the problems that we, were, Graham Nolan and I were having with Bane and, and getting our, our due from his appearance in the... Uh, last Nolan movie, Chris, Christopher Nolan movie, um, he went to bath for us. He went and he, he just nagged the hell out of DC until they realized they, 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 they'd have to start listening to us. They'd have to start you know, responding to our request for more clarification on you know, why we weren't getting uh, what we were due from that film. And um, <laughs> I remember once we were at I believe, I believe it was San Diego and Graham and I, you know, we're walking around and, and we see Neil and we go over and talk to him and we thanked him. We said, we, look, we know you've been doing a lot of behind the scenes stuff for us. You know, we didn't ask you, you know, you just did it on your own. He's like, yeah, well, I got, we got to look out for each other, blah, 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 all that. And, and then, <laughs> and then he says, you know, yeah, I got, I got something to tell you. I got, he just waves us in. And the two was like leaning over his table and he just waves and waves up. And he tells us what the deal that he and Denny got on Batman Begins for Ra's al Ghul. And he told us that they were the last ones ever to get that deal. It was a buyout, total buyout deal. And it was a whole, whole lot more money than we'd ever gotten for Bain. Uh, now, Bain, we had a continuing royalty thing. They didn't buy us out, but they didn't offer to buy us out uh, on Bain. But they did... You know, and basically that's what Denny retired on was, was that money that allowed, well, he'd already retired, but he was still writing, still had his hand in, but, but that, you know, money from Batman Begins, you know, let me just put it this way. Denny was dressing a whole lot sharper <laughs> after that movie came out. So, um, so yeah, Neil, Neil was an awesome guy, uh, you know, obviously an awesome talent. But like I said, you know, prickly pear. You don't want to get on his wrong side. You didn't want to ask him about anything that you didn't want his honest opinion. Oh, let's go. Let's go with one more. Kean Kurji, what are your top three best Bond movies and top three worst? What are some of your favorite Bond books? Um, I really liked um, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, which is the first Bond book. Um, and I really like Dr. No. And I love Goldfinger. I mean, it's a, Goldfinger in the book is a testament to Ian Fleming's talent because the golf game in Goldfinger goes on over four chapters. I don't play golf. I have no interest in golf, but I was riveted. And he describes the game. I mean, it's it, those four chapters are the gameplay between James Bond and Oric Goldfinger. And you're, you're, it's a page turner. Know, you're following because you want Bond to win. There's no, nobody's life is at stake or anything else, but you want Bond to win that game. And, um, you know, that's that's a writer, my friends. That is a writer. The top three Bond movies, Goldfinger, I think is the best Bond film ever made, not just because it's my first Bond, but because the crime is so imaginative, the villain is indelible. Uh, it's got, you know, it sort of sets the tone for all the other Bond films. It has the cold opening 
uh, pre credit sequence. It has um, a, a lot more of the gadgets. It has the car. The car is freaking amazing. Um, there's so many twists and turns in the story. And it, it's, uh, it's got a lot of Hitchcockian elements to the story, which I really like. You know, a lot of dry humor. Um, and like I said, the crime, the crime is brilliant. I mean, Rob, you know, making it look like Goldfinger is going to rob Fort Knox, which is insane. Um, but he's not going to rob Fort Knox. He's going to radiate Fort Knox to make his gold holdings worth more. I mean, that is like, my gosh, that's genius. Um, another one I really like is, uh, in the Moore camp is, um, oh my gosh. Um, Boy, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on it. It's it, it, Yeah, let me come back to that. Um, Goldeneye, the Pierce Brosnan, I, I really like. Uh, Brosnan looks like he's having the time of his life. It's a great story with a whole bunch of great villains and villainesses in it. Um, uh, you know, an a, a unforeseen twist at the end because uh, we're so used to seeing Sean Bean die in a movie and never come back. Uh, <laughs> Uh, great locations, great action, and and Brosnan really fitting into the role. It's 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 the best of of his. Um, and boy, I can't remember the name of the other one. It's 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 a Roger Moore. It's I wish I could edit this and come back to it, but but I can't. Um, it you know it ends in a Greek monastery at the end. There's a lot of scuba diving stuff in it. It, it was an attempt to uh, for your eyes only, for your eyes only. It was an attempt to, nobody's reminding me of this. I'm just recalling it. The dark recesses of my brain. Um, it, it, it's got, it, it was an attempt to, after Moonraker, <laughs> to, to bring the Bond series back to some level of seriousness, bring it back to its roots. And For Your Eyes Only is beyond a doubt the best of the, um, of the Roger Moore ones, except for the soundtrack. The Bill Conti soundtrack with little disco touches. And music, that, that's terrible. Uh, I understand there's an edit out there. Some, some fan edited it with a new soundtrack. I've, I've got to find that and watch it. Because it's one of my favorites. It's got some terrific action set pieces. And uh, it's just very well plotted. And very, very much more serious than the Moore films had been up to that point. Um, worst, um, the most recent Bond movie. Uh, yeah, no, no good. Uh, they take away everything that's great about Bond. Uh, Bond's supposed to be a bit of a prick, He's supposed to be a bit of an a-hole, and that's what we love about him. And if you start to soften that character and, you know, throw emotions in and all the rest, uh, you kind of lost, particularly the movie version of the character. The book version of the character, he's, he's a little bit more human. Uh, but, but we've grown used to the cold, austere killer. Um, the hard man, the blunt instrument of the movies. And I really prefer it that way. Uh, the last Moore movie uh, from A View to a Kill is virtually unwatchable. It's like a really bad TV movie. Uh, it could have been an episode of McCloud. <laughs> it's just that bad. Just horrible. Uh, also not a fan of Diamonds Are Forever. Uh, Jill St. John is a Bond girl. Seriously. Uh, it, it's just... Uh, Connery is out of shape. Uh, the story is, you know, weak, to say the least. Uh, repetitive of a lot of elements that had appeared in earlier Bond films. And um, some of the stuff, you know, some of the stunts in it. You know, him, him, him turning some, what was it, a Cadillac or a Lincoln up, up on its two wheels to soar down an alley. Gotta hate it, that stuff. So there you go. There you go. Well, that's it for this week. Maybe next week we'll be back with a regular format. Until then, uh, My Sister Suprema is available on Amazon or directly from Arcade and Comics. You can pick this up. It's a album. It's a European album size. It's not, it's not the size of a normal comic book. I don't have a normal comic book within reach right show. Hold on here. What do I got? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a normal ratio comic book. My Sister Suprema is a bit bigger and uh beautiful artwork by anthony gonzalez clark and uh i suggest you pick this up 
Anyway, till next time, thanks for listening, watching, whatever you do. And let me know. Do you listen? Do you watch? Do you do both? What's going on there? And I'll see you all down the road.